Um, again, thanks everyone for having me here. It's a, it's a privilege and I really apologize. Yesterday I flew into Newark uh, from Africa and uh, was stuck five hours in traffic. So apologies for not making most of yesterday. Um, but let me get into this talk. Uh, this is about a study not in South Africa but in Ghana. Uh, and it focuses on the role of product design in, in an area probably many of you have heard about, microfinance or microcredit in particular, uh, where marketing hasn't typically had a role. Um, so the motivation for this paper, as well as my research program overall, is that you know, the performance of these small scale entrepreneurs across emerging markets, there's hundreds of millions of them, it should matter, and it should matter to marketers and to multinationals, not just to policymakers or to banks. Right, and so these entrepreneurs running small businesses across emerging developing economies, uh, if we can help them increase their sales and they grow, the marketers are gonna be able to reach new markets, have more efficient distribution channels, okay? Likewise, as these firms uh, improve their profitability or prosperity for them and their employees, they become better customers for marketers, right? We can sell more to them uh, and at higher prices. So that's a general motivation. If we look at this area um, from an entrepreneur perspective, you know, what are their challenges for growth? Uh, and this is a World Bank uh, uh, cross-country study. And they ask entrepreneurs, what's the biggest obstacle affecting the operations of informal firms you know, in your market, in emerging markets? Okay, many of us sitting in the Western world might think it's, oops, it's corruption. And actually, from the viewpoint of the entrepreneur, they typically uh, at a very high frequency say limited access to finance, okay? So just the ability to access or adopt typically loan products to help their businesses grow as a major constraint. If we ask experts in these countries about their perspective, and they just had this simple question, access to finance is a significant barrier to the growth of small enterprises in my country, 76% said yes. Again, this is uh, uh, Ministry of Finance officials, World Bank officials, different NGOs globally, 76% are saying access to finance is a big problem, okay? If we look at some of the statistics briefly, in Sub-Saharan Africa alone, less than fewer, or fewer than 25% of the adult population, okay, has a, just a basic bank account. If we look at access to loans, fewer than 3% have had access to finance through a, through a loan, whether formal or informal through a bank. Versus if we compare that to the developed world, 80%, oh, Sorry, it's 80%, okay? So there's a lot of promise um, to improving access to finance in these markets for small scale firms, all right, and helping them grow so marketers can reach new markets and sell more to them. Um, but there's also pitfalls. Here's a quote from the head of the World Bank. Financial inclusion can significantly reduce and boost, reduce poverty and boost shared prosperity, but efforts to foster, foster inclusion must be well designed. And this kind of is what piques my interest, or at the time, which was maybe there's a role for marketing uh, and new insights on customer adoption, okay? If we go to literature, I'm not gonna go through all these papers right now, um, but there's been a lot of work in this area around reasons for low adoption, okay? Ranging from transaction costs all the way down to, you know, too many requirements like collateral um, uh, guarantors, et cetera, or hassle costs, et cetera, and many solutions. Most of these focus on the supply side. What can the banks do, okay? Instead, we come up with a different explanation which is driven on the demand side, going out and talking to customers. And come up with an explanation, this isn't the only explanation for low adoption, but it could be one. Hopefully at the end you'll be convinced it's maybe one factor, which is the pressure to divert. And the solution we come up with are locked loans. And what do I mean by pressure to divert? Okay, so, this could be Mama Jane here. She actually was a recipient uh, of one of our products. And what could happen is she gets, uh, she gets access to a loan, maybe for $1,000, and she's supposed to buy a fridge for it for her store. Okay, but she faces pressures. Internal pressures could be something like temptations or self-control. But basically, when she gets the $1,000, from the time she leaves the bank with the $1,000 in cash, so she has to go and buy that fridge or freezer for her business, uh, she could spend a little bit of it. Maybe she buys a dress, maybe she buys a phone, okay? And so some of the money goes away. It gets diverted from a business to non-business purpose, okay? Likewise, she could face external pressure. Sadly, especially for women, they're abused. Uh, relatives, husbands take the money, 
Okay, so it could be for external pressure reasons that the money, this lump sum of $1,000 that they, she needs to buy a productive asset to improve the business, right? Or maybe to stock that uh, new frozen ice cream we wanna push down into that market and she can't because someone outside, family, friends, pressure her and some of the money goes away. Does everyone understand? Are we all in the, feel free to ask questions throughout instead of at the end if, if they're uh, burning questions. Okay, so that's what we mean by pressure to divert. And that's profound consequences. Not only does it mean that she underinvests in productive assets, right? Inventory, equipment, or things for the business. Um, it also can lead to really tragic consequences in the spiral of debt. And I'll go quickly just some examples. Like in India, um, where microfinance debt has just had a very negative connotation now, where it's led to suicides because people become so over indebted from these loans that were meant to you know, increase earnings or be used to improve businesses, and then people can't repay. Um, a frenzy of over indebtedness. And here's an example, I just wanna read this one, uh, which highlights this idea of diversion. Um, Paju says, the first, one of the first things women do upon getting a loan is buy a television set. Okay, and then we have countless examples. These are from India, I had countless examples in my field work in Africa before running the study. So that would be an example of an internal pressure. She buys something for herself with the loan, or uh, loans for income generation, but most, uh, MFIs give us loans for income generation, but most often the money is spent elsewhere. I use the money for my daughter's marriage instead, and faulted, right? So that's external pressure, some sort of family pressure where the money was meant to improve the business, her livelihood, right? She might become a more productive small firm that we could distribute through or sell more to, and instead she, she defaults and goes into debt, okay? So there's a lot of um, examples, and I won't go through many right now, but to motivate this idea where internal or external pressures on the face of these hundreds of millions of small firms all across developing emerging economies face, okay? And I wanna just look at that as being one explanation, one potential reason why adoption is low. There could be many, in this, in this particular study, we're just gonna focus on that one and try to design a simple product that maybe overcomes it. Okay, Vinny? Yeah. Stephen, um, I mean, in this example, it seems like the original motivation was something else and then it's it changed. But could the original motivation have been to get money for the, her daughter's marriage and mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's a distinction between the two. Absolutely. Yeah, she could have, uh, right from the beginning, th thought, I'm gonna be deceptive apply for a, a small enterprise loan, because I need it for this alternative purpose, get the money, and use some of it. Yep. Also, sometimes it's for education. So it's not always a, a negative or prob problem. Um, but what I wanna just try to motivate is, maybe there's this, what my, my interest was, uh, actually when I was in the field just doing hundreds of these interviews, uh, and I would go out and study the loan folders of these uh, different banks or MFIs, and you'd see that they'd specify uh, loan purpose to buy a fridge, loan purpose to add a room in my salon where I could you know, do a fancier type of, uh, I don't know, maybe they're gonna do nails in, in addition, right? And you'd go, always go out and have this purpose that we're gonna expand our business, here's why, here's what we need the money for. Then I'd go out without any bank officials, and you know, I wouldn't have any of the loan folder materials, and just time and time again, you'd go and, and the investment wasn't made. Right, and then you t what happened, and they start to describe things that I've just sort of categorized into internal, external pressures. Um, but there's a mix of things. Sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's good. But at the heart of it, they get the loan funds, okay, and they use it for alternative purposes. And people kind of are scared of loans in many cases because they know some they can lead to bad consequences. Um, and so this is the typical existing product. Uh, which is sort of a, a cash loan. No restrictions on how the capital from the loan proceeds is invested. Has advantages like flexibility and divisibility. I'm gonna speed up. Instead, we come up uh, with this new product. Might seem simple, took a while to get a bank to let me do this. Uh, called a locked loan, where the funds are dedicated, ex ante, which means prior to ever receiving them, uh, to a productive firm asset for which the loan is sought. Some advantages, protection against internal and external pressure. Hopefully it reduces the diversion of loan funds, okay? And we think it targets a new segment of customers that we're calling frailty conscious. I'll describe what I mean by that, okay? 
Um, what do we think these customers are? This is a segment, so it's not the entire market. We don't think this product is going to appeal to the entire market. Um, but maybe there's a segment of the market who recognize their future susceptibility to give in to pressures and divert money from business to non-business purposes. Okay, that's it. And they likely avoid cash loans, and so they underinvest in their productive assets. Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah, about your diversion of the loans, I have a, just a thought maybe very appropriate. You see, if the loans are, you know, like my son when he got a scholarship for $1,000 for a university, they did not give him cash. What they did, okay, these are the books which you will be needing, these are the kinds of things which you will be needing. So the whole money was used for the purpose for which the scholarship was intended. And in my opinion, I'm from India, I know why. And if the purpose of the loan is clear, then let there be an agency say, we give you, okay, you buy the seats, you buy manuals, mm -hmm. you buy this, you buy implements, and the check will be going to them, just like insurance company. And that could be saving so many kinds of money. Yeah, it could. It could also, though, to Vineet's point, some people might need the loans and divert it to an important so reason. So. Right. Yeah, I guess there's a, there's a literature, and I, I won't go into it too much, that would suggest that cash is king, and if I'm an optimal decision maker in my firm, I should get cash. Flexibility, divisibility, liquidity of cash should win out. Um, but you're right, and, and that's where we're going, is that maybe uh, locking people into the purpose that they're meant to use the funds for could be a good thing. We don't want to force everyone to do it, we think that possibly there's a, a segment of the market that might value this kind of product. That's all we're saying. But, but you're right. Um, I don't want to play sort of policymaker hand of God and say everyone has to do this. But maybe uh, you could offer this product in a second study, which I don't have the results today. We do that, or we offer both and see. And we still get take up of both products. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I've, there, at the time when I was doing this a few years ago, there, there was not. Increasingly for sort of SMEs, uh, like larger firms, they do have, uh, especially through uh, bigger corporations, like Schneider will go in or, you know, big electric uh, uh, equipment providers and stuff, but, but not in this case, it, yeah, at that time. Um, I was in a, with the vice president of Ghana a few weeks ago, and they were mentioning that they are trying to now digitize everything the registry of assets, and maybe do uh, some idea of collateralizing through leasing or something, but I haven't seen it wide scale yet. Yeah. I apologize if you address this, but how, how common is diverting? Like what percent of people who receive loans are diverting? Mm. And then what percent do you think are, um, are frail? Or frailty conscious? I'll, the frailty conscious I'll get into when I get into some results. Um, I don't have statistics descriptives on exactly how many people get loans and divert because the banks even themselves didn't seem to be aware of it. They just said, yeah, there's some defaults. Actually, a lot of times people don't default when they divert the money. So I get $1,000, I spend, I needed this lump sum of money to make this uh, productive investment to maybe jump to a different production function. But instead, they divert a few hundred bucks and then they keep 500 in the business to buy some working capital. They sell enough to kind of repay the loan, but they just don't get ahead. Um, but yeah, I don't have statistics on that. So let me, I'm gonna hopefully get into the design because I have 13 minutes and uh, let me get through the design uh, and then some results to see what you all think, okay? So research discussion, then I'll, this would lead me to motivate my, my study and I just wanna ask two simple questions. The first is what we'd say maybe a main effect. What is the impact of a locked versus cash loan on entrepreneur's adoption? And in this case also the amount they're asking for in that application. And then I want to know, are these differences driven by frailty conscious customers who face internal pressures or external pressures to divert? Okay, so that's the heart of my study. There could be many other explanations, many other things. I'm just focusing on this, trying to isolate this one, one piece, this frailty conscious idea, okay? Research design. So we do this product adoption study. I run it as a randomized control trial in Ghana. Uh, we recruit uh, thousands of small firms across greater Accra in four branches. We measure them after we recruit them, uh, and we do what a baseline or benchmarking survey, okay? Then I'll randomize them into two groups, 
okay? And I run this marketing campaign for th actually three to six months. Uh, and they're visited multiple times by a customer service officer of the bank. They're given a flyer. I'll describe what, what we do. And we just want to see uh, over time, is there an effect on adoption, right? The number of applications completed, as well as the amount of money that, that they're asking for. Critical, I measure, my measures of, uh, to, to get at this idea of frailty conscious are done long before in the baseline, sometimes three, six, 12 months before adoption ever happens. I've measured, uh, and you can see the proxies I use, whether you believe them or not, uh, you know, these things to classify people at, in, in a segment of internal frailty conscious or external frailty conscious. And I do it long before they're ever offered the product or adopt. I have a field team, sometimes 50, 60 people out collecting data. Critically, in each branch, we, you know, with uh, grant funds, we hire additional admin officers in the bank to control everything about the study. And I'll show you what we mean. In the sample, here's some examples of what I mean by these smaller firms. The target population, which I don't want to overgeneralize my results, are going to be, this is greater Accra. Uh, so we have rural, we have central, sort of suburban areas around Accra. It's, so when we sampled, it had to be small firms. They had to be sort of the entrepreneur running a business, in charge of the business. They had to be an existing saver of the bank. Right? They had to have an account. Uh, and they had to be active, making at least one deposit in the last month. And what we did, the bank said, oh, we have thousands of clients. So they give us this database of the four or five branches in Accra we're going to use. Most of them were crap and just blank lines in the database. We got down to about 4,000. Uh, it took a couple months sending people out to verify all these uh, sort of accounts. We had roughly 4,000 small entrepreneurs. About 2,650 in the sampling frame where they were an entrepreneur, they had a bank account, and they were active in the last month, okay? Then from that group, uh, once we went out, all the different steps and collected the baseline data, we had just over 2,000. And then we randomized them into these two groups, okay? So just so they're clear, they're not offered both products. If you're in the randomized into the locked product round group, you're being offered just that product. Or if you're randomized into the, the green unlocked group, you're getting the bank's traditional existing cash loan. Okay, that's the how we do it. Here's the intervention for the locked product. <clears throat> At sign up, the loan, just as I described before, uh, loan funds are dedicated ex ante by the entrepreneur, they choose to a productive firm asset or one of the loan categories, okay? They have to go out, write the purpose of the loan, uh, get pro forma invoices for the loan, uh, and the categories are, are the same in both, but they have to be very specific upfront, you know, what, what, what's the asset they're gonna buy. The application process is identical in both, uh, identical forms, process, whether I get offered the cash product or the lock product, I have to specify the loan purpose in both. I have to get pro forma invoices in both, okay? Anonymous decisions, all the application approval decisions are made in a different state in Kamasi, hours away in the central region where the headquarters are. So everyone is blind to this being a study. And then at disbursement, if I'm in the locked, uh, locked condition, at disbursement, the loan funds are locked, ex post. A bank officer goes. <laughs> Uh, and, and they have to be put into the equipment inventory, et cetera, uh, that they specified six, 12 months before, or sorry, a couple months before. All right, the marketing campaign, right? So that's just the, what is the locked product? What is the intervention? So very simply, right at that point of disbursement, I don't give you cash. An officer in the bank goes with you and usually has a cashier check for the supplier or wherever you're gonna buy from and purchases the goods, takes a photo as evidence, that's the intervention. But the entrepreneur knows it when they're applying, actually six months before when we're marketing it to them. Does that make sense? That's the, that's the intervention. How do we do it? We, again, using these customer service officers that we control, or, or sorry, we're managing within the ban banks. We have these flyers that we pre-tested. The research team managed all the client lists centrally as well as within every branch. The lists are color coded, locked brown, cash is green. Every flyer we labeled with their client ID and name before they ever reached the branch, okay? We had a sales pitch, this is the sales script, identical in both cases, and these are like little cards that the customer service reps went out 
that the people at the head of the bank, when people came in, the loan officers described. And the only thing that's different is point three, where, where we tell them, after the loan is approved, Sanapi officer will go with you to make your purchase and ensure 100% of loan proceeds, sorry, loan funds are invested in your business. We'll also take a photo of the purchase goods uh, and receipt as evidence for your loan folder. Okay, so that, that I just wanna highlight, that is the intervention, that's the difference. Um, and then we also have these customer service officers, as I said, at each branch. Uh, they work with the clients only in our study. They ensured no con contamination at any stage, as best we could, and tried their best to ensure uh, compliance. So here would be an example. After she gets uh, some new fridges for her business, and then here's a copy of the invoices, and they took photos to make sure it did get back in the business. Okay. Um, here, many of them save these forms. Here's an example. Uh, has her name on it and client ID. All right, examples of productive assets, if it was equipment, some examples if it was inventory, this is what we mean. In the unlocked condition, it's the existing product of the bank. Six, six minutes. <laughs> All right, it's unlocked, they're gonna get the cash. That's the heart of it, okay? Disbursement, they just get the cash, they walk into the bank, they can do whatever they want. The, the, the key to the study is that at the time of adoption, when we're out pitching and giving these marketing flyers, this is what's being explained to them. They're not blindly signing up, okay? Um, and the sales script the same, except for this little piece. Okay, so measurement, we use bank admin data, we use loan officer data, we use survey data. Put it together, here's the results in the last five minutes, drum roll. So what we find, <clears throat> and, and again, uh, sort of at least standard economic theory would predict cash is king. The green group, the cash loans should be higher. I was just hoping for adoption to be roughly the same. Actually, we see slightly higher adoption of the brown locked product, okay? Um, so 42% roughly adopt uh, the brown product versus the green, and it's significantly different. And when they complete their loan application, on average, they ask for more money in the brown condition, in the locked condition, okay? If I throw these in some regressions and control for a bunch of stuff, what I see is roughly, uh, you know, a 10 to 12% higher adoption rate of the brown product, of the locked product, okay, relative to the green product. So I had 1,000 businesses in each group, and in the group that had, was offered this brown locked product, right, hey, handcuff me, more people adopted. Right? No one's as surprised as I was, but okay. <laughs> and similar with the, with the, uh, with the uh, amounts, we were also tended to be higher. Okay, and robust to lots of different checks and specifications. Marketing efforts, just as to, to rule this out when people ask, similar across the groups. Okay, so number of first flyers, number of second flyers, number of third flyer visits, um, on average, yeah? I'm just gonna ask this to uh, so what's the, uh, like, is there a chance that for the same price, you might be able to get a better deal if you buy the product through the bank. No, because you're not buying it through the bank at all. No, um, and maybe, so you still have to go out, maybe I'll put this in an appendix to the paper when I send it to Marketing Science next month. Um, <laughs> that uh, in both cases, they have to specify and describe the purpose of the loan. In both cases, they have to provide pro forma invoices, at least two of where they're gonna go and buy it. So it doesn't matter which condition, and those are in the loan folders. So I mean, this idea that in both cases, they had to go out to the outside market in terms of what are they gonna buy, where are they gonna buy it, you know, that was the bank's rule. All of that process had to be the same. Um, Can you take one minute to get to what you wanna to get to, and then we'll have hopefully a minute or two. Yeah, okay. So, so adoption's higher. Uh, and many of them even kept these, these brochures. The marketing effort did seem to be, sort of have some traction, right? It was a, hopefully a, a strong enough intervention. No differences across loan categories either, okay? So construction, equipment loans, stock vehicles, there's no difference, okay? People were just adopting brown a little bit more than the green. Um, and then another criticism comes up, or a question comes up is, well, who are these people? And you know, if I just regress or check, hey, are all these people adopting brown just those who had a loan before and they kind of know how it works? No, that's not what's driving it. So it just makes me ask the question, who's driving adoption of the lock product? 
this is where I think things call this the mechanism. We'll get into frailty conscious, recognizing one's future susceptibility to give in to pressures and divert money from business to non-business purposes. I think there's two, internal or external. Here's how I measure it. Okay, so again, months before we ever offered the product, uh, in this huge baseline survey, I always have a set at the end for mechanism, a set of questions. Here for frailty, I asked them, this is internal, um, to read these statements or enumerator reads these statements and then they answer, you know, on a scale, I spend money on non-essential things, I waste money by buying things I don't really need, okay? And then we do um, high-low splits on them. <clears throat> if I add the additional constraint that they have to be conscious or somehow, somehow forward-looking, these are the questions I ask. Okay, uh, I consider how things might be in the future and try to influence those things with my day-to-day -day behavior now, okay? If we look at adoption, right? Again, it could be, there could be other potential alternative explanations. I rule most of them out. Uh, so high frailty conscious, someone, how big is this segment? So if I were just to use the data, okay, and say in either group, like in the brown group, there were 266 of the thousand, so roughly 25% of the market was sort of in this segment that I'm calling uh, frailty conscious. Does that make sense? And, and I get equal. So because of random assignment, I have roughly the same number of sort of internal frailty conscious in both groups. But they don't adopt when they're offered the green product, but more of those internal frailty conscious types adopt in the brown group. Does that make sense? That's the heart of the study. I'm gonna hold it, sorry, because I, I, I <laughs> The regressions, uh, if I use the, the measures continuously or binary, or I add that additional constraint that they're also forward-looking, I sort of see the same pattern, okay? Where a higher, in this case, you know, maybe 35, 36% higher adoption rate comes when, you, when I'm frailty conscious and you offer me the green product, the cash product, I don't adopt. When I'm internal, high, like high on frailty conscious and you give me the brown product, I feel like, maybe I feel like it's a safe bet or something, I adopt. I get a similar pattern when I go with the external measures, okay? So again, I'm gonna do like high, low, median splits on these different questions, like in the past six months, how much money have you spent to buy larger, more expensive items for your house, okay? And then I do high, low uh, splits to see who is high in terms of having faced external pressures previously. Is that cool? And I, I see a similar pattern. In this case, roughly 37% are high frailty, 30, 35% maybe, are high frailty conscious in terms of the external measures, measured six, sometimes 12 months before. Who's adopting? I'm not seeing differences when they're low frailty conscious in adoption rates, and I am seeing differences when they're high frailty conscious in terms of these external pressures. More of them are adopting the brown product. Is that, that's the heart of the study, and I'm out of time. I'll take questions. I check a whole bunch of alternative explanations and nothing else seems to be explaining. <laughs> I'll have to wait. Um, and the, these are the, the two. After all this uh, work, I would just say this, just two findings, which is one, there seems to be this positive effect of offering people a locked uh, loan product, okay? Seems like a simple uh, intervention or a simple product design twist, um, but there is demand in the market for it. Um, and it seems to be driven by potentially some customers who are frailty conscious through external or, or internal reasons. And I, yeah, I sorry, I took questions throughout. Apologies. Right, you for a long time, so sorry. <coughs> that, that has a you use your mind when implication that is very grave. You're creating a negative bias when you offer a locked product. You probably have a lower credit quality on it because the fact that the guy is frightly <coughs> conscious is probably going to kind of like affect his repayment. Yeah. He's disciplined about the loan, but what guarantees that the rest of the business is not going to be affected by the same behavior? Mm -hmm. You check the credit quality afterwards, the payment capability and the default rate. So I, I haven't, that's a good point that um, the credit quality of those applicants could still be poor. Um, I don't check that and, and in this first study, uh, I do have metrics on like how effective the business is in, th in terms of like the kind of financial practices they're doing, how sophisticated they are, uh, but I don't have credit scores. That's a, that's a that yeah, but I, I do control for all the um, baseline characteristics in terms of how sophisticated these firms are. Okay. 
you saw that the, the coefficients don't move around that much. Um, but that's more of a, like, hey, later, does yeah. default change? Um, it could almost be another outcome I could look at. They're usually six to 12 months. Yeah, right now I'm trying to get uh, data uh, over time on savings, like other stuff, but this is, this is my third attempt at trying to run this study. I tried to run it twice with small MFIs and it fell apart and I finally got a big bank to agree. So that's it, thank you. Thank you.